everyone, and as always, welcome to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. And today, we are going to do our usual Monday, 10 a.m. Pacific setup for War in the Pacific. And we have now completed turn five. We just did that resolution yesterday on our Sunday live stream. Uh, and so we are going to start setting up for turn six today. And I thought what we'll do is we'll first go look at any new units that have arrived. All right. And then after we've looked at those new units and what we're going to be doing with them, we will then uh, go into the continental United States. Now, we in the turn five setup went and focused on China. And I think that we got China in a very good shape. Now, every turn I will go back in anything that's green on my spreadsheet. So as we went through China, I talked about, hey, this is, you know, I'm turning this green because we need to look at it every turn. Now, when I go back to China, instead of, let's say, 500 or 700 rows on the spreadsheet, I should have a more manageable 70 or 80 that I can go look at and, uh, you know, try to decide if we need to change their orders or if they've arrived where they should have arrived. We can uh, change them to combat mode. Uh, in the cases of ships and planes, uh, if they're training, they'll be yellow. I always look at those yellow ones. I say they'll be yellow. We turned them yellow. Um, and I'll go look at those and say, hey, they're training now, but should we really you know, have these training? We may need them up in the air. The Japanese may be getting close. Um, and so let me get over here to my game and I'll center on Pearl Harbor here. Uh, so we did resolve turn five. Now I'm not gonna go through all of the stats from turn five now into turn six. It's December 13th, 1941. I'm not gonna go into all those because I like to do that on our regular episodes, quote unquote. Uh, and this is more of just a setup for people that, uh, you know, wanna look and see how I do it and how I set things up and how I manage this massive game. As P. Warner says, welcome to the forever war. And it is indeed uh, at this pace, we shall, I think in this game sometime in like 20, 47. Uh, maybe we'll be completely out of pandemic territory at that point, and we can all emerge from our caves, having watched this war in the Pacific. Um, but as time goes on, things will speed up. These early turns are very, very uh, time intensive because you just have so much material that you have not set on their ultimate paths where, you know, I try to get every ship or every task force that I can into continuous supply if possible. Uh, and so a lot of those will be arriving in Los Angeles and San Francisco soon. And hopefully we can get them set up with waypoints uh, that do continuous supply just over and over and over. And we'll get down to, we have about five to 800 units we have to look at every time. And you may say, that sounds like a lot to me. Well, it is, uh, but relatively speaking in this game, it's nothing. That's just, uh, you know, a couple hours on a Sunday. As it is right now, these turns are taking me, someone that's played the game a lot, from eight hours, around eight hours, to go all the way through the turn, which is really something. I mean, that's why I love the game. I would assume if you're uh, watching that uh, it may be something that appeals to you. Uh, it is obviously the biggest and most in-depth war game, I think, you know, on the PC or board game or maybe has ever been made. So anyway, let's jump into our spreadsheet. And I'm going to go to the 1241 arrivals, and let's see what arrived here on the 13th. And on the 13th, then uh, at San Diego, we got a new AA regiment. The 69th Coast AA Regiment arrived in San Diego. So let's jump over here to beautiful San Diego. Um, I'm just up the coast, just north of LA up here. Uh, that's where I live. Uh, and San Diego, one of my favorite places on the planet. Just an absolutely gorgeous town. Uh, 69th AA is probably this one. It is indeed. Now, uh, Cole is saying no action on this, and that's because it is locked here. Uh, not a whole lot we can do with that. Uh, we will be turning that orange because ultimately... We can't move it. We can't buy it out. We can't get it off the West Coast. And so, you know, if the Japanese decide they're going to bomb San Diego, 
and that's their game plan. We will have some anti-aircraft available. Uh, the next thing down is in Tacoma. It's the 144th Infantry Regiment. So now we're starting to get a little bit bigger infantry um, regiments here. And this is up in Tacoma. We're going to rail this to Portland. Rainy Portland. So let's go up here to Tacoma. All right. And we're looking for an infantry regiment. The 144th, this is it. It has 115 assault strength. It also is locked to the West Coast. Uh, you know, these units, that's not very exciting. Um, hold on, let me move my spreadsheet here just a little bit. Uh, okay, so we're going to rail this to Portland. All right. We need to, need to have a, a nice regiment down in Portland and case the uh, Japanese come a calling and we will set the future objective also to Portland and let that build there again this is locked to the west coast you know not a whole lot we can do we'll turn that orange um, the next one is in Tacoma as well and this is the 183rd field artillery must be this one it is indeed this is not locked and so we will have um, a chance to get this out if we want to now Cole's got us railing this to Portland but setting the objective to Tillamook Tillamook where they make great cheese evidently uh, I have some in my fridge Tillamook cheese uh, that's the only thing I know about the town, so I thought I would just throw that in. So we're going to rail this down to Portland, all right? And then we're going to set the future objective down here to Tillamook, all right? Sounds good. I will keep this one... Um, uh, I'm going to actually turn it orange. Now, we have this note here that we can buy it out. I may add a note to it saying we can buy it out potentially. Um, but let's stay here in Tacoma. We now have the 260th Coast AA Regiment. It's probably this one, and it is. Uh, and Cole says no action. He says no action because this is also locked. So we're getting a lot of locked forces. You'll see this. They're going to build on the West Coast. I think traditionally um, the U.S. military used these units as training units uh, to get guys used to the equipment. How do you operate this AA equipment? Well, shoot, I don't know. Let's, you know, joyfully uh, shoot these up in the air in Tacoma and, and see, you know, what happens. Uh, but I think that that's what these traditionally really were doing. So we've got this as no action. It's going to sit here in Tacoma. That's fine. Um, then we have something in Los Angeles that is an, also an AA regiment. So let's go down here to L.A., one of the stranger towns on the planet, uh, 203rd AA. Now, I say that about L.A. because, well, where is this thing? Hold on. Let's find this before I go off on my little talk. Uh, 203rd Coast AA in L.A. Now, I'm not seeing it. What's the unit ID? 5062. Oh, okay. So it would be back this way, 50, 55, 50, 56. Yep, okay, well, it's not here yet. Um, that's been happening from time to time, you know, not often. I mean, like 0.001% of the time. Um, during the December 8th, If you weren't, yep, a couple hours on turn one. Well, you know, as you saw those videos, what did that take us? About 25 hours of, uh, of time on YouTube uh, setting that up. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of people that will just, they want to get the game going. So you set up some kind of important things or things you think are important. And then the next time you come around and you set them up again. One of the reasons I'm doing Continental US this time is, I'll be honest, for turn five, um, I did not... Uh, go through the continental US. I kind of ran out of time before Sunday and uh, I will not often do that I will say uh, but I did do it uh, because I wanted to make sure we could resolve that turn five And so I'm a turn behind here in the continental US 
Uh, so we've got to, you know, come over here and clean this up. Now I did get everything else done, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you see 22 ships in port in LA. I think in San Francisco, we have a lot of ships in port that we need to get out and get going. Now in a four year war, one day is not going to make a big difference. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I hate to not get completely through a turn before I resolve it. It's just how I am. Uh, so this time we're, I'm really going to focus on the continental U.S. because I let it lag last time. Um, okay, so let's go figure out where in the world this unit is. Uh, it's ID 5062. It's the 203rd Coast AA Regiment. Okay. Uh, all nations? No, we do not need all nations. All units? Not really. We need AA. Well, we're going to have to keep on all units. Let's take out all nations. I do believe this would be an army unit, and it is. So let's green the U.S. Army. And let's go look for the 203rd. Oh, goodness. Now I don't want all headquarters units. Why is it doing that? Hmm. All right, let's take this off first. No, I don't want the restricted attach. No. Unrestricted U.S. Army. Oh, there we go. I had restricted and attached on. Um, 203rd. So, yeah, it just has not arrived yet. Uh, and like I was saying uh, before I got distracted there, um, that's been happening with the December 8th scenario here in, you know, 0.001% of cases. Sometimes they're showing up a little bit later. Uh, my guess would be is that when they patch the game, they patched the grand scenario, the number one scenario. We're playing like scenario number six, and sometimes those did not get patched. So they probably had someone who had a grandfather that was in the 203rd Coast AA Regiment that when they first had the game, it arrives a little later, and that person says, nope, I know that they got to LA on such and such a date, or you know, somebody else said, well, that doesn't make sense, or this and that and the other, and they've in one of the patches, they've moved up the grand scenario when this arrives. Uh, but for right now, in our game, it is not here yet. But as we've been seeing, and we could go up here and, and look at our uh, reinforce or what's coming in. But I don't want to go look at the info screen because I want to save that for a regular episode. Uh, but I'm sure that we will see the 203rd and it will arrive in L.A sooner rather than later. Now in San Diego, we supposedly have the 204th. Let's see if that's actually arrived. 69th? No, no. I think this one's not here either. 204th, it's the 5063 is its ID number. And that is not here as well. We will have to mark this green and come back and look for it next time. Now there was no, um, movement for that one anyway the 203rd we're going to be railing to seattle and then eventually sending to dutch harbor uh, so we are building up dutch harbor up in alaska a little bit um then it says seattle we have the 210th supposedly but some for some reason the army has not gotten our aa regiments out here to the west coast like they should be uh the 210th in seattle it is not here yet okay We'll turn that green as well. Well, now that this is happening, all right. Now, avert your eyes, and let's go look at ground reinforcement schedule. And let's see, and here we see them all. 203rd, the 204th, the 210th, all AA. As you see here, yep, this is, this is what we're looking for. They will actually be arriving in two days, and so we'll have to go back. Oh my goodness, that two days, but uh, we'll be all right. We'll be all right uh, not having that uh, two days out there. Um, yeah, uh, P. Warner brings up a good point. You can use variable arrival too. Uh, generally, when I play the AI, I don't uh, because it doesn't matter. Uh, if you're playing a human, uh, it's, I like to vary them, you know. I mean, if you're playing a really good player, Japanese player, they know exactly when you're getting things, where they can even, you know, lay traps for you. Uh, that especially is true up near uh, Aiden or Abaddon, if they do get subs up there somehow. Um, you know, they can just lay in wait, because they know essentially when you're getting stuff. So I do like the variable arrival. Uh, it can be more fun that way. Oh, and I had moved into the 14th as well. So those are actually 
uh, going to be one day late. Uh, but I'll keep those green because next time when we come and look at that, uh, I'll know that we'll need to keep looking at it. Now let's get into the actual real setup page. Uh, well, I guess they're both kind of the same, but these are the things that were already on the map at the start of the game. And that starts us in Alameda, California. I have been to Alameda. Uh, there is nothing interesting I can tell you about Alameda. It is basically um, a part of San Francisco and not one of the fun parts. Uh, but that's fine. No offense to anyone that lives in Alameda, San Francisco. That area is absolutely gorgeous, if incredibly expensive. So in Alameda, we have had some Catalinas that were there, and we have transferred those to San Francisco. So let's go and make sure that they are in San Francisco. It's Unit 2741, and here they are. Yes, indeed. Uh, there are six of them, and they are out here training for naval search. Okay, so that looks good. Um, so that is yellow, of course. Although Cole has mentioned on his spreadsheet that he uses this as a training unit. Okay, um, as a matter of fact, let's go back to it really quickly and see if it's locked. It's not locked, um, and so I'm going to have this yellow and keep it yellow. We'll probably keep it here as a training unit because Cole is a very smart man. Uh, but we may not. We may eventually do something with it. Who knows? Uh, and so I always keep those um, yellow. Hey, Stanley. Good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. How are you doing? How is uh, your area of the world right now? All right, well, we're going to keep moving down Alameda. We have the base, industry, industry. I always turn those red. And then we're going to get to the first LCU at Alameda, which is the 217th Field AA Battalion. All right, and we are marching this to Mare Island. And Mare Island is right here. I think it's already arrived. It has. It's right here. We have already set it to combat mode. Okay. That all looks good, so I'm going to turn that orange. Now, Mare Island is kind of a staging base behind San Francisco here. It's, uh, you know, it's got a decent-sized port and airfield, the kind of port you would kill for out in the middle of the Pacific, uh, but here it's just kind of a secondary port if San Francisco maybe gets a little too loaded up, which is hard to do. Um, the next thing down out of Alameda was the AK Alcoa Prospector. Uh, that was, is a ship. It's an uh, XAK, so a civilian cargo ship. That was uh, scheduled to merge with San Francisco Task Force 1. That task force is loading troops and planes in San Francisco. Okay, let's go look for that. And that must already be on its way. Uh, because I do not see it here. And so it is likely on its way. And as a matter of fact, I've already turned this orange on my spread spreadsheet, so they have merged up. Uh, the next place we're going is Astoria. And if I remember, well, I'm going to go make absolutely sure, but I think Astoria is up north a little bit. I've never been to Astoria. There we go. It is at 2.11.55. Oh, okay, so Astoria is right on the... Co oh, gosh, I bet you that's beautiful. All of this area right up here is beautiful. I've just never been quite up this direction. Um, so Astoria, we are not doing anything with anything in Astoria. We're building forts. We're expanding the airfield there. We do have uh, engineers in transit to Astoria uh, that are coming, I believe, from Portland, uh, that will help us build up those things. Now, of course, eventually we'll probably get some ASW flights out here. Uh, so, you know, we'll want to get some Catalinas here, something like that, and uh, get some ASW flights out there. Yeah, Stanley, you're saying it's winter. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I told you guys before, obviously, that I, I did live in Chicago, recently moved out to California uh, not that long ago. Uh, it's even cold and windy in California. Now, cold here is a little different. It's probably 50. Uh, but everybody here, of course, is not used to it. They're completely bundled up. Uh, they, they think it's pure winter. 
Uh, but it's like 50, but it is very windy. So the palm trees are taking a beating. Um, oh, you guys, let me know too. Does the video still look good? Uh, I've kept the, all the same settings that we did last time. Everybody was telling me it looks so much better last time. that You can really see it. Uh, I think it's running at 1080 maybe. Um, and so good, you know, hopefully it is. Uh, but let me know in the comments. I just want to make sure for what, you, you know, to know what you guys are seeing out there. So Astoria, we had uh, repair shipyard resources. We had this uh, Columbia defenses, which are these this big coastal gun. Uh, we're just not doing anything in Astoria. Those can all be red. Then we go to Bakersfield. And what do we have going on in Bakersfield? Uh, Bakersfield it is an exceptionally hot place. Um, I have a sister that lives out in Bakersfield. And uh, yeah, it's... It, you know, 110, people will post those, uh, you know, the four, four or five day forecast where it's like 110, 115, 112 uh, during the summer. It gets very hot out there in the, what they call the Inland Valley uh, or Inland, or it's, I think it's called the Inland Empire, right? And a lot of people, you know, come through here on their way to Vegas if they don't go down to LA first. Uh, so anyway, what's going on in Bakersfield? Nothing. Really, really nothing's going on at all. We didn't have anything there. Now, there's oil resources, manpower, light industry, airfield. I turn all those red on the spreadsheet, and we are through Bakersfield. Uh, next, we have the BB Colorado. Uh, so we have the Colorado and the War Spite, two battleships that we are getting repaired. I believe they're in Seattle. We can go look at them here in a minute. Uh, if they aren't, but nope, they're right here. We have put the Colorado and the War Spite here into the repair yard at Seattle. They are progressing. Seattle has a 200,000 capacity, 65,000 being used by these two. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're getting worked on. They have system damage. And so we've sent them off to the shipyard. It's going to be 21 days and 13 days respectively. But that's great. We'll get, you know, it's like getting two brand new battleships. Uh, and, you know, we can put those two. Um... Okay, Stanley says the, uh, the video is good. Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, and I'm never, ever touching those settings again. You know, I had to dig deep on YouTube to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, anyway, so the... Uh, Colorado and the War Spite are here at Seattle. They're getting repaired. It'll be like two brand new battleships. Uh, looking forward to sailing those out. Now, one thing I will tell you is be very careful. I've mentioned this before. Um, the AI, when it sees a high value ship, and that's part of what makes the AI in this game pretty dang good, is when it sees a high value ship or detects a high value ship, it goes for it. Um, even maybe to its detriment a little bit, but I like it to play aggressive like that. And one of the first times I ever played this game, I was like, oh, great. You know, I have these two new battleships and I sailed them out here together uh, through the strait past Victoria and I was steaming them towards um, Pearl Harbor. And I think they got about right here and two Japanese subs sunk them both. And <laughs> that was quite a wake up call to always always send ASW or some form of ASW with your capital ships, your good capital ships. Uh, speaking of which, let's go see, what are these worth? Uh, 188. You see it's still smoking up there. The Colorado is 185. You know, so two pretty, pretty uh, valuable ships. Do not send them out there unguarded out that straight because the Japanese will be getting some ASW or some uh, submarines, I'm sorry, out in this area soon. They will also have a lot of subs right down in here pretty soon. Uh, we've already seen that in Australia or over by Nomaya. We lost some ships uh, this last turn, which we'll go over in the regular, you know, turn talk uh, next time. Uh, but yeah, we lost some ships here or a ship or two. Uh, from some submarine work. So the, the Japanese subs are already deploying 
they're out there, they're looking for us, uh, so you have to be careful. Uh, so the Colorado and the War Spite, I have those green uh, for now because, you know, it's going to be 13 days and 21 days, so it's going to be a little bit of time, uh, but we will eventually need to go look at those and get them going to Pearl Harbor and then figure out what we want to do with them from there. Um, so next is Boise. Now, I had never been to Boise uh, until recently uh, when my wife and I moved from Chicago to California. We decided to take a nice cross-country trip, and we did uh, end up up here in Idaho, and we, saw, we just saw a bunch of stuff uh, that I've never seen before, a beautiful part of the country. We went through uh, Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone, uh, a lot of the national parks out here. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I highly recommend it if you ever get a chance to go through the western U.S. over here. Um, David asks, what works best for ASW? It's definitely ships. Uh, it is the rare, rare time that you actually have a plane uh, do any good ASW work early on. Uh, and the reason for that's, um, I guess, kind of obvious. You know, I, I always ask the same question uh, when I started the game. Uh, but I guess it's kind of obvious is at this time, planes did not have uh, sophisticated equipment to detect things under the water. So the only way a plane is going to spot a submarine is if the submarine has actually surfaced and they get a visual on it. Well, think about what a needle in the haystack that is, right? Now, your good ASW ships are starting to get uh, uh, sur surface radar, and they can also detect under, so sonar. And because of that, they're going to they're going to have a much better, or going to have they have much better luck detecting submarines uh, with the air stuff. You know, you're going to count on one or two hands the number of times, especially early in the game, that you have a plane that detects a submarine. Uh, they're really good for, they may spot a submarine out there, and then once it's spotted, if you have your anti-sub ships with a max react of, let's say, three, if it's within three hexes and a plane spots it, having surfaced, then all your ships will run over there, all your ASW ships will run over there and try to depth charge it. Uh, but really getting it from a plane, very, very difficult. Uh, and so you're gonna always, almost always anyway, get submarines from depth charges from your ships. So uh, kind of a long answer to your question, ships are better. Uh, but you, I do both. You should do both because you have a lot of these planes that really aren't doing much else. And so even if all they do is spot a submarine on the surface uh, and alert your ships to that, it's worth it. You know, um, anytime. P. Warner says planes are not. I'm not saying they're useless. I mean, they're not useless. You'll get one every once in a while. But again, I mean, you know, think about 40 nautical square miles here. Uh, for a plane to spot a submarine actually surfacing is pretty rare. Uh, but no, I mean, they're not useless. And you, uh, like I said, you have a lot of these planes that that's really their only good use. I mean, you're not using them for anything else. Uh, so you, you should have them running ASW all the time. I've got them all set up. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Knowing it's theirs, half the battle, uh, for sure. You know, uh, again, when you destroy them, it's oftentimes going to be the ship that comes over and depth charges it. Uh, but again, always set them up, always have them going, uh, because they are definitely worth your time to do that, because the Japanese have a limited number of subs. The, every one of them that you take out really hurts them, uh, as opposed to the Allies, which, you know, after a while here, the U.S. is cranking out subs, uh, you know, like like McDonald's hamburgers, you know, I they're just coming off the line all the time. Um, and so the Japanese do not have that. And because of that, you know, every Japanese sub that you can take out is well worth your time. Um, let's keep going down here. Oh, so Boise. Now we, we transferred this Bolo group, which is the first thing at Boise, to San Francisco. It's running ASW 50. 
out here at San Francisco. Speaking of ASW, let's go down to San Francisco and we'll uh, see. Now, why aren't they running? 3730 is the unit ID. So let's go find, there they are. ASW, we've got them at 5,000, maximum range 11, ASW 50. We got them on a 20 train, so they're still training up a little bit. Um, and so, oh, I think, oh, there we go. Uh, so there, there is their ASW fan. Uh, so they've got good coverage here from you know, almost to the coast all the way around. So there are some planes flying ASW. And then we had another one in Boise that we transferred to Tacoma. So let's go look at that one. And you see that ASW fan. That looks good. That is, what's the unit ID? It is 3652. It's the, these guys. Um, some B-26 Marauders, actually. They're in the 4 U.S. Bomber Command. After you play for a while, you'll realize the 4 uh, headquarters is locked to the West Coast. Um, the 5 is not. Uh, and that goes for the 4 U.S. Bomber and U.S. Fighter. Uh, the 5 U.S. Bomber and U.S. Fighter is is already ready to go to the Pacific. Uh, now, you can buy this out if you wanted these Marauders to get out. Um, and you'll see here, okay, well, if we kept them on the West Coast or we kept them on something uh, tied to the West Coast, it would be 13 points, 52 points to get them out. That's not terrible for 11 planes. Uh, you know, something we'll think about later. Now, we'll be getting a lot of planes. We do not need to even contemplate buying this out now, um, but just something to think about in the future. For right now, they're running this nice coverage of ASW here. Uh, so I'm turning these orange, by the way. They're where they're supposed to be. They're running the missions they're supposed to run. Uh, we're really not going to do anything with them for a while. Uh, we also have, we also moved some Marauders to Corvallis. Uh, Corvallis is right here. There we go. And they are also running ASW. That's perfect. We'll keep them on orange. All of these are running 50% ASW patrol, and they're training for 20% uh, of the time to keep, you know, just keep them getting better and better. Uh, uh, maybe eventually when they get uh, these pilots really experienced, these pilots will come out and then they will be really good ASW pilots somewhere else. Uh, in Boise, we also had a training group up here. Whoops. I've lost Boise. Uh, but where did they go? Oh, we have them hopping. Okay, so this training group, they're training 100. They're B-26 Marauders. They're training 100 for ground attacks. Great. So we had them hop to Vancouver. Now this is 3654. Oh, I remember this group. Let's see. Okay, let's go talk about this group for a minute. Oh, they're not here yet. Uh, oh, I, they must be on the railway. Thirty-six fifty-four. Yeah, because they're not at Boise still. These did get transferred on the railway, so they're going to show up at Vancouver in a day or two. Uh, I wish it showed. You know, whenever you transfer planes on the railway, um, you don't see them until they get to where they're supposed to go. Uh, that's fine. So anyway, this is that group that is supposed to hop from Boise to Vancouver. Um, and then originally said Cold Bay, but now it's Midway. Uh, we may lose Midway by then. But then Midway to Palmyra, Palmyra to Savi, and Savi all the way to Nomaya. So we're taking these guys all the way out to Nomaya, uh, which is really something. But we'll look at that in future turns. That's kind of fun, uh, watching them hop all the way across the Pacific. All right, let's move on to, well, we're still in Boise. Um, we did disband this B-18A Bolo group, um, and we've said we're going to reform them. All the planes went to the group above them, I believe. 
uh, that's fine. So we disbanded them. They just went to a different group, and then we'll reform this squadron uh, in 120 days. Then at Boise, we're building forts. We're expanding the airfield. Now, question whether you really need to build a fort in Boise, but hey, you got all the supply in the world. Why not? Um, we have engineers actually coming to Boise. The reason that is, is because Boise is a great place to train pilots. As you build this up, you can get this airfield up to a seven. Hell, you could get this airfield up to a nine if you really wanted to. Uh, so you can just train here and remember that they're on the West Coast instead of on the East Coast. If you don't do this, it's not the biggest thing in the world. Uh, but, you know, you can build up this airfield a little bit. Um, the next thing, Channel Islands. The Channel Islands, if you ever get a chance, so I can see the Channel Islands from where I live, uh, they are beautiful. There are nice tours that go out around the Ch Channel Islands. Uh, and for whatever reason, there are just a ton of dolphins uh, and evidently whales, I guess. It's a really good whale watching spot down here. If we look, uh, these are the Channel Islands out here. And you can go, you know, take a take a boat that goes out and around them. And there's a lot of whale watching. And they also uh, have a ton of dolphins. But what they always tell you, now whether this is true or not, but what they tell you on the tour is that th there is more marine life here than anywhere else on the planet. Is it true? I don't know. Uh, but that's what they tell you on that tour. Uh, and there is a lot. My wife and I went out there. Uh, she actually started crying because she saw so many dolphins. Um, so it was, she's over here. She thought that was funny, but it's true. She, she, she loves dolphins. Um, 20 planes leave and three planes. Arrive. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. People are, um, moving on down. I've gotten sidetracked a few times today. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm like a tour guide here. Um, let's look now at, well, we go through Butte. Nothing's happening. Uh, the CL Concorde has some planes on there, some seagulls. Uh, those planes, always on a light cruiser, are uh, running, you know, naval search. They're out looking around. It, it's kind of recon. Now they can shoot in naval search mode. They could fire on something if they wanted to, uh, but we've just got them, you know, doing naval search. Then we go down to Coos Bay, nothing happening there, nothing happening at Corvallis. And then we get to the CV Saratoga. So let's go look at the Saratoga, one of our three American carriers that we have. Now, we also have a British light carrier, the Hermes, which is being repaired in Colombo. Um, now, you may remember we slowed the Saratoga way down, and that's because we still have Japanese sub activity, which you're going to have. Now, this turn is the turn I am going to start getting everything out from Hawaii, uh, from Pearl Harbor, and getting it active. Uh, at this point, I don't know. We, we have not spotted the Kido Butai, the main Japanese task force. It must have gone past us here. It must be up here somewhere. I do not know why we haven't laid eyes on it. I'll have to say this is like maybe the only time I've ever played the game where... I don't know where that task force is in turn six. You know, uh, even if by accident, you usually spot it somehow. My guess is the Japanese are trying to land on wake here. My guess is, is that it wheeled out of Pearl Harbor and came right back here and we just somehow missed it. Uh, you know, or it missed us is maybe the better way to say it. And my guess is, is that it's coming to wake to provide any kind of support that they may need. They don't really need any, although they've been throwing really crappy combat values at us, trying to take Wake. I mean, they haven't even come close yet. Uh, and so maybe the Kido Butai will come in here, you know, pound the crap out of us, cause, because, I mean, they've got, you know, hundreds of aircraft uh, in that task force. And so I, I don't know where they are. They're out here somewhere. There's no way, they do not have enough fuel they do not have enough weapons, uh, armaments to stay in this area for this long. So they are heading back west somewhere. Now, is it northwest? And maybe they'll show up up here by Midway. Well, I think they would already be there. Uh, and so that leads me to believe they are going straight west. Let's just hope they didn't do anything too crazy here and somehow go south. But again, 
after that attack on Pearl Harbor, they really need to return to one, a, a major Japanese base to rearm and refuel. And so it just doesn't seem likely to me. Um, uh, David's asking, where can you find the individual unit numbers for ships? That's a good question. Oh, well, I mean, uh, where can you search for it? I'm not sure where you can search for it. Uh, you know, they're, once they're in task forces, it's going to say this, you know, like task force 405. Uh, but for the individual ships, I'm not even, do they have an ID like that? Uh, let's go find something. Okay, the New Orleans is not in a task force yet. It's just down here uh, at Pearl Harbor. I don't know, David, that they have an individual unit ID number. Um, and I think that's because, well, I don't know why that, yeah, I don't think that they do. You know, the task forces get numbers uh, as you create them, you know, they just kind of get a random uh, task force number that you can use to track it. But for individual ships, I don't know. Uh, you know, it shows you task forces here. Uh, it shows you if they're not in a task force where they are uh, anchored. But I, I don't I don't think there is such a thing. So I, I don't know. I, I guess that's my answer. Um, and you won't hear me say that often, but uh, <laughs> or at least I try not to. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't I don't think they have individual IDs. Uh, you can go search by the name, obviously, uh, when you go up here to the list active ships, and it always comes up. Uh, you know, carriers, battleships, uh, battle carriers or battle cruisers, and then regular cruise, you know, it always kind of comes up in that order. So if you know what kind of ship it is, uh, you can just flip down here. Look at all the destroyers we have now. We just got a bunch of destroyers, and we have a bunch at Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is going to take a lot to set up this time, and I think that's probably what we'll do on Wednesday. Um, yeah, Stanley, I know that, you know, you would think a task force, so Stanley says it's not easy to spot them. That's true. I mean, you know, you're thinking 40 miles per hex here, uh, 40 nautical miles, 46 regular miles, I guess is how that works out. Um, but I don't know, you know, I've just always spotted them before. Uh, now, I am adhering a lot closer to Cole's spreadsheet this time than I have for you know, several years, uh, just over the years, I've, I've started to do certain things differently. And this one, I don't know, he does not have as many ships out uh, as early as I do. Uh, and so, you know, we were a little more conservative uh, this time, and maybe that's why I haven't spotted them. Uh, but this time we are going to, you know, start getting all of our Pearl Harbor stuff out. Because of that, I guess, you know, we've kind of gone a long winding path here. Because of that, I'm going to... Um, I kind of want it just to sit still because I don't want it to get to Pearl really at all at this point, but we'll leave it on cruise speed. That gives us another turn to get all of our destroyers out here and hopefully run these Japanese subs off because we're going to be deploying like, you know, 15 or 20 destroyers. Um, Yeah, you know, like, you're right, Stanley. So, you know, like CV2 Lexington, we have the, the traditional uh, Navy kind of numbering system. Uh, but, yeah, we, there's not like a game system unless you put them in a task force. They just don't have an ID like that. Um, okay, so we've looked at the Saratoga. I think we've already got all of its planes doing what they should be doing. Uh, let's go see. Uh, we've got naval search going on with the Dauntlesses. That's VB3. Yep, that all looks good. We've got uh, some escort cap going. Now, we will have to change this, actually, because the way we've got our... And this actually has five squadrons on it. Don't forget about these buffaloes just because they're not on the first page. you got to click, you know, you got to kind of move your mouse wheel down one. Uh, these guys are training 100%. You know, uh, as we get into more hostile waters here, I actually would want them, 
Hmm. Yeah, let's check. Oh, we got to get off train 100%. Let's get the Buffaloes up. Just running a little cap. It doesn't have to be a lot. We'll do 30-30, which is kind of what the minimum. If I'm doing what I think is kind of the minimum, I'll do 30-30 like this. So, you know, escort here. That's fine. Now, we already, we just looked at these dot. Let's look at both dauntlesses. These guys are training. So what do we have the other guys set to? We've got them at 50 search, and they have a specific search pattern, which is kind of interesting, 210 to 300. So we have them looking like northwest, which is probably smart. That's probably where the Japanese would be if all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we run into their carrier task force out here. Um, so why don't we have these other Dauntlesses run uh, some general naval, naval search? Let's uh, whoops. Let's do like 50. Eh, yeah, 50. We'll have them train 10 for now, and we'll just have them run kind of a general naval search. Whoops. Uh, let's get back to that. Uh, we have the Wildcats. We'll get them up. Okay, they're already doing some cap 30. Let's make this 30 30. That's fine. And let's see, we got the Devastators, uh, our Torpedo Bombers. They are doing ASW, that's good, 50 and 20, I like that, uh, 5,000, okay, that all looks good. So we're doing some ASW, we've got some Torpedo Bombers, as a matter of fact, we have 12 of them up, and we've got some Naval Search going on with our Dauntlesses, uh, Dauntless, you know, they're an okay, they're a dive bomber. Um, so we got them doing some naval search. Look, if we run into the, the main Japanese task force with Saratoga here, we're screwed. So it, you know, we could just have it sit out here for a turn. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to do that. I'm be, I'm getting really conservative in my old age. I'm just going to have them sit here. Uh, no, this is not what I want. I'm going to have you sit here. Okay. Let's have it, it'll move one hex this turn. Um, it's just going to sit there for a turn, and we'll get our destroyers out around Pearl. We'll get our planes, more planes up in the air, running all kinds of ASW, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, you can use float planes. Uh, so P. Warner says you use float planes for search or ASW, uh, both both. I mean, usually on the light cruiser, it depends where they are. If they're by themselves, uh, meaning, you know, if you have a light cruiser, so you have a task force that the main ship or the flagship is a light cruiser, I would probably just have it do naval search. Uh, I guess it really depends where it is. If it's way behind the lines, so you're not expecting that you would ever see a Japanese task force, have it do ASW. Um, that's kind of the big overall rule. If it's near kind of the front lines of the naval action, uh, you may want to have it do search. But if it's way back, of course, have it do ASW, because the only thing you're really going to see down there is a Japanese submarine. Um, also, the force composition. So if I have light cruisers in a, uh, a task force like this, like with the Saratoga, uh, I would probably have them do some naval search because you've got other things doing ASW. It just depends what you you have so many planes that would be doing different things. It just kind of depends on the composition. Um, but I guess so. I guess the main rule is really is it close to being at the edge of where you may see a Japanese surface task force, or are you far enough back that really the only thing you would probably ever see is a submarine? Uh, and so I guess that would kind of be my general rule. Uh, let's see. Oh, David says there are art mods. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, I, you know, I never run an art mod on this, which I know is odd, because people run all kinds of mods. The only one I do is this map mod, because I do think it makes the game look a lot better. Um... Uh, P. Warner saying... Uh, yeah, you can use the float planes for cap. You could. Yeah, you're not going to get. Believe me, if, if you know that's what you got for your cap, that you've got some float planes up. If Japanese 
uh, aircraft or fighters are coming at you or bombers are coming at you or a task force and all you have is a float plane up or a few float planes up, don't even bother. I mean, you know, they're going to get blown up and they're not going to stop anything. Uh, so, yeah, I would always have those on ASW uh, or Naval Search, one of the two. They're really recon. That's all they are. On those light cruisers and heavy cruisers, both, uh, if you've got those float planes out there, they're just they're just for recon. They're really not going to do a whole lot for you. Um, okay, so Saratoga we've taken uh, care of. We're just going to have this kind of sit still. The guys can get out on deck, have a few beers, hang out, swab the decks, you know, get it clean for get the ship clean for its entry into Pearl Harbor. Uh, but we're going to give that one more turn. By next turn, you will see a lot of green out here, and hopefully we can chase these Japanese subs away. You do not want to lose a carrier by just pure accident because you bring it in here too hot. It does not need to be at Pearl Harbor this turn. It doesn't need to be at Pearl Harbor for another 10, 20, 30 turns probably. Um, and so... You know, I want to have all three of our carriers together. Speaking of which, where is our other carrier task force? Is that all the way down here? My goodness. Is it going to have enough gas? Enough fuel? I always say gas. You know, I guess a lot of these ships run on diesel. Uh, Lexington is all the way down here. Yeah, it's got plenty. It's, uh, it's going at mission speed. You may remember we went full speed, deadhead, straight south, um, to get out of the way of a potential Japanese task force turning west very quickly on us. Maybe that happened, but we still haven't seen it yet. But anyway, now it's making its slow return. It's all the way down here. Um, you know, it's down here by the Samoas, down by Pago. Uh, and now it's going to head north up here. We are going to take it south of Christmas Island. And then here... And then up to Pearl. And then we'll have all three of our carrier task forces together. I like to do that early in the game because they're not as good as the Japanese uh, carrier task forces. And so if you do run into the Japanese in some kind of surface battle like that, uh, or a carrier battle, uh, better said, you want all three together and aggregated to give yourself a chance. If they get caught out all by their lonesome, uh, they're... They're in a lot of trouble if they run into a good Japanese carrier task force. Now, the Japanese do have these light carrier task forces. Uh, right now, we know that there's one. Oh, gosh, I'm probably making you dizzy going across the map like that. We know that there's one out here. I believe this is a, a light carrier Japanese force. Uh, those are not as scary for you. Uh, but if you run into the really good Japanese uh, carrier forces, you don't want to do that on your own. At least if you have all three of them together, you have a fighting chance to, you know, back them off a little bit. Now, that is very unlikely at Pearl Harbor. Eventually, what we'll do is uh, probably keep two of them together in and around this area that will eventually start moving this way. And then we'll add in a third as we get more carriers. Uh, and then we'll send two down to kind of protect our Iron Crescent. I usually use those as kind of a mobile reserve force, I guess. So we'll have a lot of planes down here on Pago Pago, Nomaya, Suva. Uh, we'll have a lot of planes down in this area, uh, if I can get over here. Uh, Suva, you know, Pago Pago, and Nomaya, where we're building our fence here. We'll have a lot of planes on the, the bases for each of these. Uh, but then I'll also usually bring a couple of carriers down in this area and kind of have them as a mobile reserve if the Japanese get any ideas to start push, trying to push us back from our initial fence up here. All right. Um, okay. So we're through to Saratoga. Next, we go to Eureka, California. And I've actually never been up this far north in California. I'm sure it is splendid up there. Uh, not doing anything in Eureka. We're building up the fort, expanding the airfield. Uh, we do have engineers on their way there. And you'll see we also have this AVBT. Oh, we've got this as an airplane tender out here. Just kind of hanging out. <laughs> so, you know. 
you've got a lot of ships. Uh, question whether we would actually really ever need a tender out here. The reason we're doing it is I think we'll eventually fly ASW out here. We're just not doing it yet. Uh, Fort Ord. Okay. Where is Fort? There's Fort Ord. It is down the coast from San Francisco. Um, and at Fort Ord, we had some... What did we have here? Oh, we had some Vigilance, some O49s. I believe those are Recons and O47As. Uh, we transferred both of those to San Francisco and we're training them. Okay, and so this is 3544. Yeah, these are recon planes. Ten of these, so that's nice. They are attached to the fourth, and again, everything with a four in, in it uh, when it comes to U.S. planes is pretty much going to be attached to the West Coast. It is. Now, you can run, eventually we'll run some uh, recon out here or maybe even some naval search. Uh, these should, you know, usually recon planes have a good range. These do not. Uh, so, you know, question how valuable they are. They're, they're really not much. Uh, 3551. Let's see what we have going there. And these are 12 planes. Okay. Same idea. Same thing. These have a much better range. These 047As, uh, they can get out to eight. All right. So we'll probably run some recon. You know, really, does it matter how much, how well these guys are trained? Well, you may save yourself an operational loss or something. So we'll keep training them. They're not that important. Uh, Ford Ord, we're just building forts, expanding the airfield. Now, we do have some LCUs here at Ford Ord that can be bought out. Um, so I'm keeping them orange. We've got the 159th motorized. All right. That's got an assault value of 83. It can be bought out of the West Coast here. Uh, it would cost 336 points, so, you know. We'll see. Now we're going to keep that one orange. And then we have the field artillery here that's, you know, packs a punch. It shows zero assault strength. But obviously, if you have howitzers like this, you have good bombardment strength, which does not necessarily show up uh, like a traditional ground unit assault strength would. Uh, this, this would be very nice to add to um, some ground units when we start to assault things. Uh, they're good for a bombardment attacks. Uh, we can also buy this one out. This one would cost 226 to get it out of the West Coast. Again, we'll keep that orange because we may come back to that. Now, the tank group, the 757th, that is locked. So there's not a whole lot we can do about that. Um, that's red. I mean, there's just nothing, you know, it, it's going to be sitting here. We're, we've got it as no action on our spreadsheet. Not a whole lot we can do. Now at Fort Ord, we also had the 7th Motorized Infantry Tank that we railed down to LA. And what is, that is 6855 as the unit ID. All right, it's probably these guys. It is indeed. We've got them in strategic mode. Let's move them over to move mode. Uh, their objective is LA, or move them over to combat mode, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's because they're locked on the West Coast. That goes to red. Not much we can do about that. Now, you may say, well, can we buy the West Coast out? No, West Coast, it shows here, are restricted. Uh, that that uh, headquarters unit, you can't get that out no matter what. Now, sometimes these uh, units, these regiments, battalions, divisions, will show that, you know, they cannot be bought out themselves, but their headquarters can be bought out. When their headquarters is bought out, it buys out everything underneath it. That's not the case with the headquarters unit west coast okay um fort ord we've got a static engineer corps we've got a headquarters unit there the three u.s corps is there let's actually go look at that really quickly because i'm just kind of curious uh what the third u.s corps headquarters is it's this one it's attached to the west coast okay uh hey this guy's actually a pretty decent leader uh, John P. Lucas, Major General John P. Lucas. He's a guy to keep in mind to maybe lead something else if we can do that. I'll have to go look into, you know, how many points he'll cost, etc., uh, and if he's restricted at all. Um, but th that's pretty good. 58, 58, that's not bad at all. His admin's 68. 
that's pretty nice. Uh, 51 on land, not great, but not terrible. He's a lot better than some of the crap we've got out in the Pacific, so we'll have to go look uh, at some point. But this one is attached to the West Coast. We cannot move it. This headquarters, now he is not. We could potentially move him, uh, and so we'll come and look at that. And with that, our hour of fun is up. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed my travel advice this episode. I'm glad that the video seems to be working great. Uh, 